Psalm 151 and victory and vindication in this day of the Lord. Isaiah 61. Psalm 151. The angel of the presence of God, who is the person of the Spirit of the Holy God, and the angelic messenger of his words, as the word of the Lord, came to me and said, You are to write these words of the God of Israel. I have come to the earth to dwell with my anointed one, Titus Makardi, as I once came to dwell among the tents of the Israelites. And he writes and speaks my words exactly as I speak them to him, as my servant Moses did. Keith Ellis McCarty is the twig that sprouts from a shoot that grows out of the stump of Jesse, the lineal descendant of King David to King Solomon, prophesied by my servant Isaiah, a son of David, upon whom my spirit, that is the angel of my presence, alighted upon and entered in the first year of his life in 1957, and I was in my spirit, revealing myself to him in 2007. Keith Ellis McCarty is Elijah, prophesied by my servant Malachi to return in the day of the Lord to clear the way before me, to deliver the new covenant with my forgiveness of the sins of the Jewish people, I declared in the book of Jeremiah, and to recounsel the members of the families of the Jewish people, each to the other being mindful of the teachings and laws I gave Moses. That or bringing the Jewish families to or back to the observance of Judaism and righteousness and in right standing with me. Keith Ellis McCarty is the prophet like Moses, prophesied by me and written by my servant Moses, whom I speak to face to face and as one friend to another, that I converse with whenever I so wish and who converses with me whenever he so wishes. And who writes my words exactly as I tell him to. Keith Ellis McCarty is my righteous servant. Prophesied by my servant Isaiah. That makes the many righteous. The man of suffering. Familiar with disease. That I chose. To crush with disease. Who made his soul and himself an offering. For the guilt of the Jewish people in a test of devotion. The man who I have wounded, chastised, bruised, crushed, maltreated, and punished in the world and by my hand all of his life. The man that has been exposed to death four times by my power and survived by my power. The man I have given long life to in order that he accomplishes his many tasks. And the man who is my visible representation in the day of the Lord, speaking and writing my words. Keith Ellis McCarty is the only Gentile who I have written into the scroll of remembrance. I am preparing for this day, the day of the Lord. For the heaven I am creating for the Jewish people. He passed my test of devotion. He agreed to go through my fire of refinement to prepare him as a prophet suitable for my purposes. And for all the suffering he has endured in life for the Jewish people and myself. Keith Ellis McCarty is a host of the Lord's host, which means my Holy Spirit alighted upon him, entered him, and my presence is in my Holy Spirit. I control his every perception, decision, judgment, thought, physical action, mannerisms, and words in my power throughout the day and night. 
my presence and the presence of my Holy Spirit are always with him wherever he may be until the day at my discretion he dies. And Keith Ellis McCarty is a priest forever, a rightful king by my decree after the manner of Melchizedek and my son David. My hand shall be constantly with him and my arm shall strengthen him. No enemy shall oppress him and no vile man will afflict him. My faithfulness and steadfast love will and shall be with him. I am God. I created all things. I divided light and I divided water. I create and formed Keith Ellis McCarty for my purposes, just as I formed and created Israel for my purposes. And this is how scripture is written. The word of the Lord came to me and said, write this down. Isaiah 61, victory and vindication. Verse 1, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me as a herald of joy to the humble, to bind up the wounded of heart, to proclaim release to the captives, liberation to the imprisoned, to proclaim, this is verse 2, to proclaim a year of the Lord's favor and a day of vindication by our God, to comfort all who mourn. Regarding this phrase, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me, that is a reference to Isaiah chapter 11, verses, uh, I think it's verse 2, but verses 1 and 2. It says that the Spirit of God alighting upon a man to perform tasks is an anointment by God. The speaker cannot be Jesus, though he said he was the fulfillment of it. This is from... John, no, it's Luke. Luke the historian, chapter 4, verses 16 through 21. And he taught, that would be Jesus, in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up and... As his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And the eyes of all men that were in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began to say unto them, This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. Luke chapter 4, which of course is a direct reference to Isaiah 61, which is a, also a direct reference to chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. So this is Jesus claiming he is the man described in chapter 11, the descendant of King David. The twig that sprouts, the twig being the mushyak that sprouts, that's a descendant that from the shoot, that's the descendant, that grows from the stump of Jesse. Jesse is the father of King David. 
The line of Jesus of the kings of Judah is the ancestral tree cut down, leaving the stump that the true Moshe comes from. Jesus cannot be the man of Isaiah chapter 11, according to the book of Matthew. His line, the, the, the first book, the first page of the New Testament begins with the line of the kings of Judah that were banished when the temple was destroyed and they were deported to Babylon. God said, No descendant of yours shall ever rule from the throne of David over Judah again. So, lying and deceiving those at synagogue, all who followed him at that time, and all that follow him today, The man who God forsake on the cross. Because the man of chapter 11 is described in chapter 53. He believed he was that man. He found out on the cross he wasn't. He wasn't going to be given long life. The year of the Lord's favor and the day of vindication by our God is a direct reference to the awesome, fearful day of the Lord of Malachi 3 and the return of God to his temple. The day of the Lord's favor and vindication proclaimed by Jesus ended in his crucifixion and death. God was in his temple, and 40 or so years later, the Romans destroyed Jerusalem and the temple of God. He was to ride an ass into Jerusalem and defeat Rome, become king of the world. And he changed that. He lied. He deceived. He said, when I ride this ass into Jerusalem, they will mock me, spate me, scourge me, kill me, that I shall rise on the third day. To proclaim release to the captives and liberation to the imprisoned, according to Rashi, means, that is to say, to bring them the tidings of the redemption. Verse 3, to provide for the mourners in Zion, to give them a turban instead of ashes, the festive ointment instead of mourning, a garment of splendor instead of a drooping spirit, they shall be called terebinths of victory, planted by the Lord for his glory. And they shall build the ancient ruins, raise up the desolations of old, and renew the ruined cities, the desolations of many ages, which is the description of the land after the Roman dispersion. From Isaiah chapter 51 to the end of his book, 64, 65, um, you can find references to the Roman dispersal. So this is the Roman dispersal who has returned, renewed the ruined cities and the desolation of many ages. This did not happen in the Second Temple era. The northern kingdom was inhabited by Gentiles. The time to come of Jeremiah is the day of the Lord. He makes a new covenant. I will put my teaching into their inmost being and inscribe it upon their hearts. It is a way of saying the purpose of Elijah to bring the families of the Jewish people back to practicing Judaism and righteousness and right standing with God will prosper. Those that he and fear God will return or go to and return if they have left observant Judaism to synagogue, learning and practicing the teachings of God to stay in right standing with him, effectively putting God's teaching into the inmost being and inscribing upon their hearts. In other words, the day of the Lord is going gonna, is gonna to wake up a lot of the Jewish people and say, you know, it is true 
My belief wasn't strong enough. I want to be an observant Jew for God. He's, he's granted me sin forgiveness for everything I've ever done in my life. He's given me a free slate. And I'm going to show my respect for him. And being our God, the Jewish people. By being an observant Jew, mindful of his teaching that he gave to, to Moses that order. God's prophecy is based on absolute knowledge of humanity from beginning to end. In the days of Jeremiah, it was time to look forward to the days of the third temple. And God had Jeremiah write his words accordingly. A time to come. The time when Israel returns to the land of desolation, makes it bloom again and renews the old cities in Jerusalem. And that is today. Verse 5, strangers shall stand and pasture your flocks. Aliens shall be your plowmen and vine trimmers. Today, the stranger among the Jewish people are the Israeli Arabs and Israeli Christians. The aliens are the Palestinians and Arabs who are not Israelis. The strangers and aliens would expect to be paid today. Verse 6, while you shall be called priests of the Lord and termed servants of our God, you shall enjoy the wealth of nations and revel in their riches. Israel is one of the greatest countries in the world. They have wealth, as wealth and riches equal to any nation for its size and more than most. The nations are not going to give Israel their wealth and riches as many believe will happen in the Messianic era. They have the same wealth and riches and do not need handouts. This kind of verses were for antiquity. People of the nations, Gentiles, are not going to come and take care of you, give you their stuff until your land or anything. It's gonna. It's the same world. You got. You need something done in your land. Pay somebody. If you can find cheap labor and they're Gentiles, that's just great. Verse seven. Because your shame was double, men cried, "Disgrace is their portion." Assuredly, they shall have a double share in their land. Joy shall be theirs for all time. Joy for all time for the Jewish people who will never be defeated and dispersed again. And God places his sanctuary among them again in this day of the Lord. Verse 8. For I love the Lord, for I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery with a burnt offering. I will pay them their wages faithfully and make a covenant covenant with them for all time. There was not a covenant made with the exiles who returned in the Second Temple era. There is one in the day of the Lord being delivered by Elijah who clears the way for the building of the temple that God says in his covenant of friendship that he is going to place amongst his people again eternally and they will never be dispersed and defeated again. Verse 9, their offspring shall be known among the nations, their descendants in the midst of the peoples. All who see them shall recognize that they are a stock the Lord has blessed. As I was mentioning, verse 8 references the covenant made with Moses and the Israelites, which is eternal. But it's never complete until the vindication of the Lord and the awesome, fearful day of the Lord of Malachi 3. And I say it's not complete. It's because he's making an amendment to it. And he's adding to it sin forgiveness, which caused, which is the, the total package of all that addition and amendment in the fact that he's here doing what 
he said he was going to do, and he's doing it how he's always done things. He selected a man. That man is me. I can't tell you why. I don't know why. Nobody's more surprised than me. I can assure you. When God makes a new covenant with the Jewish people, that he that includes he will be their God and they will be his people. He keeps repeating it. But you can almost take it as there was some period of time when he wasn't. But that's not true at all. He's just repeating the first covenant because that's what the first covenant is. And he's making an amendment to it. Listen to Moses. Now it's be mindful of what I told Moses. And again, I mentioned in another video, that's for the uh, Judaism's religious movements from ortho Orthodox to Orthodox, Conservative, Reform, to debate amongst themselves, amongst their movements. Uh, you know, they, they will, in all likelihood, all come up with a different answer. But that's how God wrote the Torah. He left things vague, he left things open for the people to decide themselves and, and their representatives. The recognition among the nations that the Jewish people are a stock the Lord has blessed requires that the third temple be built. Verse 10 and 11. I greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being exults in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of triumph, wrapped me in a robe of victory. Like a bridegroom adorned with a turban, like a bride bedecked with her finery. For as the earth brings forth her growth and a garden makes the seed shoot up, so the Lord God will make victory and renown shoot up in the presence of all the nations. Victory and renown for the Roman dispersal. It's not the exiles. And, and he was one of them. No, not Isaiah. It's like that. That's Jeremiah. Victory and renown for the Roman dispersal will be in the building of the third and final temple of God. Despite the attempts of the nations... To stop them. Now that did happen with the exiles when they returned during the second temple. The people of the northern kingdom, the Gentiles, did indeed obstruct what they were trying to get done. And they will never be uprooted and overthrown again. The exiles that returned from Babylon, Assyria, Persia, they became the Roman dispersal. So they were actually defeated and dispersed again. A lot of these things just simply don't apply to them. And of course, Moshe didn't come in their time. They referred to him as the branch or Rambam did. He's a twig. I'm Elijah, and I come with and deliver the new covenant of Jeremiah 31, a sin forgiveness, elaborated on in Malachi 3, with an amendment to God's covenant with the Israelites in the day of the Lord. He is your God, Jewish people, and you are and always will be his people. This begins, this very video, but it's actually, it's in my books, which I've already mentioned. And God has said when they're published, when everybody, those who don't have internet, when everybody can get and read and understand who's delivering it and what people will be saying at that time by then of me and these videos. The six videos I have on Isaiah 53, but the book uh, Isaiah 53 and the Day of the Lord has so much more in it and I'm going to continue making videos on it. Everyone can read it free right now and of course I hope when it does get published uh, you buy a copy for your coffee table. So this begins the redemption of the Jewish people. It's not the Messianic era. Although the Moshiach is here. That's kind of how he even got his name. And his victory and vindication over the nations. Well, thank you for listening to this. 
God wrote that psalm a long time ago. I never really expected him to deliver it, and certainly not in this fashion. But uh, I'm glad he did. There's too much at stake with this thing. Naysayers, I'm going to have to just push them aside. False teachers, same thing.